Now I'm going to go ahead and take your question. I have two brief questions. The first one was, uh, you said corn oil is high in omega-3s. Oh, I'm sorry, that was a mistake. It's high in omega-6s. I'm sorry, that's what I meant. It's okay, okay. So since corn, I assume that's corn oil, does that mean corn is high in omega-6? Excellent question. And that is the, really helps illustrate one of the basic points between eating whole foods versus eating fractionated foods. I used to know the statistic, but to get one tablespoon of corn oil, you'd have to eat about 10 or 12 ears of corn. And that's about as much corn as you could stuff into you. But if you go to a restaurant and have a stir fry, they might have three or four tablespoons of corn oil in there. Or if you go eat some, and I, you know, vegan ice cream is probably healthier than non-vegan ice cream, but some of the vegan junk food out there also contains just more than you would eat in whole natural foods. And it's an interesting point. You wouldn't think, you don't think a corn is a high fat food, but if you extract it down, you get rid of the water, get rid of the fiber, get rid of all the sugar in there to make high fructose corn syrup out of, you're left with some oil. Um, so by eating the whole food, you're not going to run into problems. But when you concentrate the oil, you can. So that was one question. An analysis of omega-3 to omega-6 in vegan foods. And uh, so I can eat, uh, and you said the best ratio is one to one. Approximately. So four to one is OK, can, but somewhere, yeah. So I'm concerned about the other end. I can eat a diet where the ratio is much higher of omega-3 to omega-6, like one to four or one to seven, something like that. Is that, would that be unwise? I believe so. Um, in traditional human diets, the, the highest ratio goes is about two times more omega-3s than omega-6s. With most people, you know, I've discussed it this way just because most people have too much of this and not enough of this. Just like when we talk about pH balance, we talk about getting alkaline because most people are too acid. Well, you can go too far the other way. And if you go too far here, you can end up with a deficiency of the omega-6s, which can cause some of the same problems as with omega-3 deficiency. So you, wanna, you do want to tend to keep things in balance. OK, and then your question, and then I'll. So for an athlete or an average person who wants to lose weight, right, to be realistic in terms of telling them, OK, you know you need to go into a vegetarian diet. I mean, no one's going to just do that. So if you're talking <laughs> about burning fat, what is the most effective way to fat? And your fat cells remain in your body. Is that, is that still a fat? Uh, I believe so, so. I mean, if the fat turns into carbon dioxide and water, what is the most efficient way to get rid of fat? Well, interestingly enough, omega-3 fats do actually help you burn fat. So you want some of these, but not too much. You don't need to add any extra oil. So we mentioned in my wife's case, by eating fruits and vegetables and leafy greens, she's actually getting enough fat just from that. Um, the biggest issue, though, which is a little bit beyond the scope of this particular talk, is that you want to eat foods that are low in calorie density. And when you satisfy your calorie and nutrient needs on foods that fill you up a lot, you tend to eat the right amount of calories, and your body naturally tends to go toward its ideal body weight. And those things are foods with a lot of water in them and a lot of fiber. So fresh fruits and vegetables and other whole natural plant foods, just think about it. If you were to fill your stomach up with grapes, you'd probably eat about 300 calories and you'd be pretty full. If you dehydrated those grapes into raisins and you filled your stomach up with raisins, you could probably get about 1,000 calories in there. So the same with even, even raw food. Like, in fact, we have a raw pizza out there that has more omega-3s than omega-6s. Uh, we make them at our, we're going to make them at our next class on um, October 21st, I believe it is. So we have some pizza slices out there to sell. But for example, you wouldn't want to make that a staple in your diet because the crust is dehydrated. Then we have a cheese layer made out of mac nuts and almonds. You'd want, and when we serve those at our classes, we serve a big giant salad with a lot of low calorie density food and then you have a little bit of pizza so it balances out. That's the biggest issue. Um, can you add a little bit of avocado or nuts or seeds? Absolutely. You know, you don't have to avoid those things like the plague, but you want to make sure you're eating a lot of the low calorie density foods in abundance. And, and then the good news is when you're doing that, you're naturally activating your apostatic mechanism, which tells your hypothalamus to create what's called satiety, or the feeling of fullness, and you're not having to try to fake your body out. Just like we know when we're too hot, or too cold, or thirsty, or when we need to go to the bathroom, when we give our body what it needs, 
our apostat apostatic mechanisms work properly as well. Okay, uh, ma'am, let's answer your question. It sounds as though if you just get that tablespoon of flaxseed, ground flaxseed, you're making a good you know, balancing act here. Right, exactly. And this may be a little personal, but why isn't your wife doing flaxseed in her diet? Well, because we figured that she was getting enough alpha linolenic acid from the fresh fruits and vegetables. Now, it's interesting that in the past year since we started, or year or so since we started teaching our raw food one day workshops, uh, we made this incredibly good raw hummus recipe. And we love that stuff. And it has sesame seeds in it, which are high in omega 6s, but then we also put some flax in there, number one, to balance out the ratio, and number two, it just makes the texture a little bit nicer. Um, we, we just love that stuff, and maybe three nights a week we make that. It's definitely dense food. It's, it's fairly dense. Um, the, the bulk of the volume is actually zucchini. We don't use chickpeas in it, but it's zucchini, and then soaked sesame seeds and flax seeds, and some lemon juice and some miso, all ground up in the Vitamix, and it's, it's, it's delicious. So in any case, in the last year, a few nights a week, we, we just pour a cup or so of that over a big salad and makes kind of like a hummus salad casserole, sort of. So at some point soon, when we test her again, we're going to be very interested to see the difference now that she's consuming flax seeds on a more regular basis. But again, the good news is before, even without the flax seeds, she had enough DHA. But if you're not eating large quantities of fresh produce, including large quantities of greens, which admittedly not everybody does, although it's a good idea, then the flax seeds really come in handy. Okay, and uh, how about you in the back, sir, with the blue shirt? Are there omega-2s and omega-5s, for example, and are they relevant to this? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Most of the fats happen after the um, third, or, or, okay, let me start over again. Most double bonds occur three carbons apart. That's just the way nature generally seems to do it. So for example, alpha linolenic acid, the omega-3 fat, its double bonds are after the third carbon, the sixth carbon, and the ninth carbon. Then when they add another double bond to make this stuff, that's after the twelfth carbon. And then it does the fifteenth and the eighteenth. So in general, in nature, they're three apart. Now there are, and they call that methylene interrupted, if you want to know the technical name. Now there are some things, for example, there's some stuff called conjugated linoleic acid, which we've heard of. And that's actually, interestingly, a trans fat, which isn't really so healthy. Um, but when it's conjugated, that, that can mean that the double bonds are two carbons apart. But most of them occur three carbons apart, and that just seems to be the way that nature makes things. Um, and there was, was there another point I was going to make about that? Uh, no, I, I think that was it. So does that answer? Oh, but anyway, so like for example, oleic acid, which is found in almonds, avocados, and olives, is an omega-9 fat because it has one double bond. We talked about olive oil before. It has one double bond, and it's after the ninth carbon. That's just the way that is. I don't think there's a two or a five. I think that coconuts have a little bit of some omega-7 fat. But those are pretty rare and unusual. Most of them are after the multiples of three. And yes, sir, hey, I remember you from Fort Bragg. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, as for coconut oil, so which omega is that? Is it like, yeah, how would you classify that? Most coconut oil is saturated fat. Yes. Now, typically in animal foods, most of the saturated fat tends to be 18 carbons long. So it's, it's called stearic acid. Now, what happens here? We've got our fat end and then our acid end. The acid end is reactive. The fat end is very inert. So for example, saturated fats tend to clump together easily and get stiff. They're very good for insulating certain nerve fibers because they don't conduct electrical activity. But if you can imagine, if this part is reactive and this part is non-reactive, the longer the saturated fat is, the more non-reactive part you have. So in coconuts, you do have saturated fat, but instead of being 18 carbons long, you have like 10, 12, and 14 carbon chains. And the shorter chain means more of it's reactive and less of it's inert, so it's actually a bit easier for your body to digest. But similarly with the corn and the corn oil, and the coconuts and the coconut oil. If you want to eat some coconuts every now and then, 
no big deal. But I would not go out of my way to consume coconut oil. You're just going to end up with just more total fat than you need. Okay, and uh, ma'am, let's get your question. Um, do we need to be concerned with omega-9? And what about the other three fatty acids in the omega-3 family that you didn't mention? Oh, okay. Let, let, I'll go backwards. The other three fatty acids are this one here. It's called stearidonic acid. This one here called ETA, icosotetraenoic acid. It's like EPA, but it has four double bonds. And this one's called clupanodonic acid. And basically, they have very little relevance to human nutrition. They're just not the key players. That's why I kind of ignored those and, and just put the big important ones out. And what about omega-9? That... Omega-9 is what we just mentioned that's found in olives, avocados, we and any... almonds. Well, that's not an essential fat. Oh, because remember we said earlier, the body can't insert double bonds to the left of the seventh carbon. So an omega-9 is after the ninth carbon from the left, so your body can actually make oleic acid if needed. Now the good news in terms of inflammation is that those omega-9 fats, un un unless you eat really large quantities of them, they don't compete with those, some of those same enzymes. So, Olive oil, even though I'm not, again, not recommending oil, if you were to use oil, if you used olive oil, say, instead of corn oil, you would not be contributing to this whole inflammatory process nearly as much as if you were to use an omega-6 fat. So that's where the omega-9s come in handy. So they're relatively neutral, but even olive oil still has some omega-6s and doesn't have omega-3. So if you want to use a little, no big deal. But I, and, and by the way, with olive oil, all the studies that show benefit from olive oil show that if when you consume less saturated fat and in its place put monounsaturated olive oil, your triglycerides go down, your cholesterol goes down, there are some various benefits. But no study has ever shown if you're on a really healthy diet to begin with and then you add olive oil that then there's going to be benefits. You know, it's sort of like if you have a 20 to 1 ratio of sixes to threes, and you eat some walnuts, that's going to be good because seven to one in walnuts is better than 20 to one in your average diet. But if you're at four to one, and that's where you want to be, and then you eat some walnuts, well, they're actually going to bring you the wrong way. So same kind of thing. OK, so um, in the black zip up. Of this stuff. Now what happens is um, they say not to heat up flaxseed oil because once you press an oil out, now it's really susceptible to oxidation. So the good oils like barleens, for example, they store it in the, in the plastic black container so light can't get in there to oxidize it. They keep it in the refrigerator so the heat doesn't oxidize it and oxygen doesn't get in. But apparently when you've got a whole intact vegetable, even when there's some light heat applied to it, like steaming some broccoli, for example, the omega-3 fats within that stay relatively intact if you eat it fresh. Apparently what they say is if you cook it and then leave it a day or two, then the fats start to break down. But if you eat those green leafy vegetables fresh, even if you've cooked them to some degree, they're still a very good source of this omega-3 essential fat. Excellent question. Now, th then that's a great point. Let me just cover that before I get to the next question. All right, so they say don't cook with, ol with flax oil, right, because it's susceptible to oxidation because of those double bonds. And it has three double bonds. But then let's take fish with five double bonds and six double bonds and let's cook that. You know, now, again, it's, it's in the fish. It's not extracted out in the oil. But nevertheless, this stuff is extremely susceptible to oxidation damage. And when you heat it, you magnify that tremendously. So when you cook fish, you destroy a lot of the beneficial omega-3 properties from fish. All, strictly from an omega-3 point of view, three minutes left. OK, strictly from an omega-3 point of view, raw fish would be better than cooked fish. Although you want to make sure it's really clean because you don't want to run into the, the other complications. Okay, and uh, I forgot, is it Amanda. Amanda? I thought so, okay. What's your opinion on a healthy percentage of fat in the diet overall? 
great question. Probably somewhere, depending on your activity level, somewhere in the range of like 10 to 15 at the low end to maybe up to about 30% fat on the higher end. So Yeah, well, and, and part of that is it depends what else you're eating. If you want to stay 100% raw, for example, I would say you could go up to, as long as it's healthy fats, like 30, maybe even up to 40% fat if you're all raw and you're really active. I can remember times in my life, a few years back, when I was running 25 to 30 miles a week, and I spent over three times about two or three hours or maybe four or five hours in the gym working on my upper body. So that's a lot of exercise. What I would often do when I came home is I would have some almond milk that I made. So you take almonds that are pretty calorie dense. I'd soak them first to make them easier to digest, grind them up with water, strain all the fiber out, and you're left with, and then I put about six bananas in there. And I figured at the time I was eating about 40% of my calories from fat, but when I got my blood checked, my cholesterol was about 120. Uh, my HDL was really high, my triglycerides were really low, it wasn't interfering with insulin, everything was still working right. I wouldn't go that high unless you're exercising a real lot. Or part of the reason that um, I do some leafy green vegetables besides the omega-3s and the minerals is by steaming some vegetables that adds a little bit more calorie density to my diet. Therefore I'm not eating more fat or I'm not going overboard eating too much fruit. So if you're a cooked food vegan, then I would say you want to keep the percentage of your calories probably below, below about 20%. If you're eating more raw, you can go a little bit higher and, and you know, that still balances out overall. I think that's probably all the time I have. I, I don't want to get in trouble down there. Um, I'm going to be heading over to my booth and thank you very much for coming.